Let's talk about the artist that made Gibson do something different. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Let's go ahead and get into it. This is a Japanese signature artist that made Gibson make a double cut that is like nothing we had ever seen at the time of release. So we need to talk a little bit more on that here in a minute. Let's just take a second to take this in. We've got a toggle switch on the upper bout. We only have three controls. Zebra bobbin pickups with an ABR1 bridge. And we've got abalone inlays with black binding with this kind of cool aqua blue top. But then when you get to the back, it's a dark blue color. And on top of that, it's quite chunky. I was expecting this thing to be light. But those are some pretty unique specs. So who is this a signature model for? Well, his name is Takmatsumoto, best known for being part of the J-Rock group group B's, B apostrophe Z. They're one of the best selling rock duos over in Japan. I usually say he's the slash of Japan to put you into the mindset that he is a household name if you're into this genre of music. And in fact, he was the first Japanese signature artist to get a signature guitar from Gibson all the way back in 1999. So that's another way he's like Slasher Bonamassa. He's had so many signature guitars with many companies, including Epiphone, Gibson USA, as well as the Gibson Custom Shop. If there's a Gibson version of it, there's probably a rare Epiphone as well. He's had his Les Pauls, like the straight up yellow one, as well as the Tack Burst that we talked about in this episode, again, with the different lineups. But he also has this really weird Firebird with a little bit of flame going on, but a Les Paul headstock, we need to document one of those. But today I really wanna focus on his double cuts. There's an ebony one that's been dressed up like a Les Paul custom. There's the blue one that we're talking about today. There's a straight up gold. One of my favorites is the crazy quilt top custom shop root beers. There's also a cherry red version out there and also a natural Karina bodied one. But no matter what signature guitar of his that you choose, it's always the same attributes. You've got the zebra bobbin pickups with the abalone inlays matched with black binding. That is just his signature thing. And no pick guard on any of these. So whenever you're shopping for guitars in Japan and you see something very similarly laid out, it's most likely due to his influence on that. But I've always been curious about these DCs, so when somebody offered the trade of these two, I thought, eh, why not? We might as well review them. Because here it is as compared to a Les Paul. It is very similar as far as like their lower bout, they just kind of change the cutaways at the top. Because most people just assume it's off of a 50s Les Paul Double Cut Junior. This is a 90s Pro with the freaky headstock. But it's like the closest thing if you threw a flame maple top on one of them. You can still see the horns are vastly different. Even this one seems a little bit shortened. And this one just a little bit longer. I've always thought it was most similar to the modern double cut via photos. However, seeing them side by side, this is significantly smaller. And this came out way before they did the modern double cuts. And previous to today, I always thought this inspired Gibson to bring these guys out to the USA market and just change them up. But they really are different now that I can do a side by side comparison. It's really strange. I mean, it does feel like a Les Paul. It's just the top has been changed in familiar ways to other guitars. So that's pretty fascinating. But here's a nice wide shot comparison of all of them together. I'm so happy I can do this for a living. This is what makes me excited is seeing all the guitars together. That's where the magic truly happens to see how the horns are different. This one has like a constant swoop. Whereas this one has a little bit of a flatter spot right there before it swoops in. And that one's got a bit more of a lamer horn, whereas that one goes up more so akin to the Les Paul DC Pro. And I suppose to be complete, we might as well compare it to a proper junior. This one's not vintage, but it's the Billy Joe Armstrong signature. So you can see the cutaway shapes here as compared to what you'd have. So it truly is its own thing. There's not a proper one for one replacement. You just have to go for one of the tack signature double cuts if you want exactly what it is. But I truly think the best way to describe it is Les Paul's bottom, but inspired by these horns and modified to match the vibes of the original body, I guess. This particular version that we're documenting today is part of his custom shop series of instruments. And if you're searching for one of these, it's important to know that there's at least two main runs to this version. As far as I'm aware, the guitars are the same, but the very first one has a different case. It really looks Fender-like. It's cream with brown accents and really hard to see white Gibson logos as well as his signature. The first run, COA, had a photo of him on the inside as well as a stitch signature on the outside. And the back toggle plate had a special 30th, 50th anniversary birthday 
Celebration instead of the Gibson Custom. And I believe that's the only one that got the special blue truss rod cover, although I could be wrong on that. Now, if you're curious how much you're going to have to pay for one of these double cuts, these used to be incredibly cheap. There wasn't a big demand for them, but I think people have tried them, you know, similar to me in this episode and realized, you know, maybe they're not as crazy as I thought they were because prices have like two to three axed on these things recently. I guess we'll have to find out today if they're sleepers or not. But what kind of case do we have? It's actually a pretty cool rectangular one. It's not as big as an Explorer case. It's still, you know, regular size. And you've got tax signature over here. And then for case candy. We've got a nice fancy COA booklet here. Oddly enough, no space for a photo of TAC play in one of these. But here you can see everything that they had called it here. Then we've got two minty fresh warranty and owner's manual stuff. This is case candy you only get for Japanese exclusive guitars, this one is. Mainly because it's in Japanese. But outside of a Les Paul photo, it's really not that special. And this is just your typical one. But this does seem to have better penmanship than usual. As far as personal stuff in here, looks like we have some import papers. That's part of why he wanted to make this trade. He was so excited to see Attack Burst already in the USA. It didn't have to go through any hassles. Looks like we have a nice seatbelt-like strap. Is anybody else like me? You hate leather straps, but you love these ones. They just feel nicer, in my opinion. And then, oh no, I didn't realize this. These are two of the original tuners. What we have on the headstock here is known as a string butler. That is not factory stock. But the way these things work is they mount underneath your tuner. However, if you look, this had the vintage style Clusens, so somebody has reamed the headstock out just for those two tuners to put that there, which is now an irreversible modification. So, ah, <laughs> that really breaks my heart because I was ready to rip that thing off, just cut the nut properly, and then you're usually good to go. But yeah, that's now stuck on this guitar unless you want washer marks, but we'll take a look at that on the workbench. But here's the original packaging for that. But speaking of the workbench, let's go ahead and throw it on there now to take a look at its parts and specs before we get to a playing sample. She cleaned up beautifully. Let's take a look at these pickups. So we already talked about the zebra bobbins. But as far as I'm aware, his signature guitars always have the Burst Bucker 2 in the neck and the Burst Bucker 3 in the bridge. This one was wound by Fanseri on 1031 of 2012. This one dates to 422 of 13. As far as the pickup cavities, you can see the long neck tendon construction, nice and flush. Our maple block capping off our truss rod route, as well as how thick the maple top is before it joins onto the mahogany body. I don't see any type of markings within any of these cavities though, as is pretty typical on custom chops. But within the circuit, the bridge reads 8.53k ohms, the neck a little bit less at 8, and the middle just for fun, 4.13. And now let's verify our controls. I believe it's two volumes and a master tone. That checks out. So if we roll off this, it should go to zero. Yep. And also if we roll this one off, it should also go to zero. Verified. However, normally on a Les Paul, your neck controls line up with your stop bar tailpiece. So that means this would normally be like right here. So he had them shift it up. Then he must just not ever use that one. So he had him do the whole weird three thing. Reminds me of that Billy Gibbons signature gold top. Typical custom shop knobs with the thumb bleeders. Then we do have an ABR1 bridge mounted traditionally, and a lightweight aluminum tailpiece. This cleaned up pretty good, but since somebody liked to top wrap it, you do have some impressions slash scratches if you're looking for them. Here's what the back looks like. But I would say the upper bout is about nine and a quarter inches at the widest areas. And then it's 13 inches on the lower bout, just like a Les Paul. And then the length of the body is 14. With a depth of about 1.7 inches. You have to remember it's a carved top, so I would hazard a guess something like 2.25. If you had a device to measure from the top of the belly to the very back. So it is indeed thinner than a Les Paul. Those typically measure around two inches, not accounting for the belly. So even though the dimensions are similar, that's something that you could use to help guide you. Do you want his double cut version or do you prefer the regular Les Paul? But something else that's cool about this carved top double cut is the fact that it does not have chambering. Most of the double cut Les Paul standards, which you could also kind of compare these two, are chambered. So that makes them vastly different being solid body. But outside of the root beer one, this aqua blue has always been my favorite because it just has such a cool hue to it and the flames dance nicely now that it's been polished up. It's a bit pinstripey, but hey, it is what it is. Reminds you of the ocean water. But moving on from the two-piece maple top and mahogany body, we've got the mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. I decided to give the frets the ultra shiny polish job as well because it just works so well with the abalone inlays. 
So they've got a lot of green and blues and a whole bunch of crazy sporadicness to them. And I don't know about you guys, but I love this rosewood fretboard. It's got so much red streakiness to it. Nearly reminds me of zebra wood at times. And I didn't really notice any fretware or anything. Black binding is always hard to see, but it does indeed have black fret nibs too. I got a nut width of 1.69 inches, increasing to 2.07 at the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.86 and 0.97 by the 12th. Here's a look at that neck profile, first fret and 12th fret. I would almost say it's closer to a D-shaped territory. It's very flat on the back with some shoulders. Now our headstock. I was pleasantly surprised. So somebody used a conversion bushing product as well as a specially designed tuner so they didn't have to ream out the headstock, which was very good. Thankfully, I was able to remove that contraption from our headstock so we can have a more normal looking one now. So you can actually see his moniker right here, Takamatsumoto, very, very faint. Many of his signatures actually do have his name on them. For example, the Les Pauls right here. Our truss rod is the typical historic style. And as far as condition goes, you get a little bit of a stand rash right here where it was hanging up, running the light over it. Looks like that string butler didn't do any damage. There's a small impression ding right here on the top and a couple in this area as well. But overall, this thing's pretty clean. This ding up here on the side of the headstock is probably the worst thing condition-wise. And now our dark blue back. This actually cleaned up nicely. I thought there was a big gouge right here, but it ended up polishing out. Outside of some light wear and minor scratches, nothing too bad. Outside of this ding right there, and then a couple of other dings along the edge from a strap or something. Check out this control cavity. You could modify one of these for a second tone position if you really wanted to. It's still there, but we just get to see the flame top from the back. And it's just typical custom shop wiring with a tiny little capacitor. But hey, that's kind of cool. Our grounding wire comes from there, and the channel routes are rather small on this model. You did not want weight relief. The toggle switch cavity is pretty cool. It's a custom size. It's not the regular Les Paul one. But even though this isn't a first edition with his anniversary banner, you do still get something special. It says Gibson Custom. And this thing weighs like twice as much as it looks. It's like extra thick. So that's a heavy duty sticker. The fact that it's so small makes it kind of cute. Here's a look at the output jack. And someone has Schaller strap locks on this one. Top and bottom. I'm really surprised not to see any type of comfort cut right here though like most double cut Les Pauls have. He probably didn't want it to feel different from a Les Paul. He doesn't seem like that big of a guy like you'd really need it, especially since the body has been slightly slimmed down. And we can run up the back of the neck. Again, nice dark blue finish. Makes it hard to see anything, but here we can see those stand marks. Unfortunate, but present. Thankfully, it's a dark finish, so they're not overly apparent. Then we've got our original Gibson Deluxe tuners back on. Then the serial number of this one is TAC AB4006. So TAC, obviously, for Takahiro Matsumoto, AB for Aqua Burst, and then 4006. I would imagine these were made in batches of about 200, because I refuse to believe there are 4,000 of these things out there. So this is probably something like batch four production number six. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that'd be close. All said and done, this one weighs seven pounds, one ounce. Pretty good weight for a solid body that doesn't have any major weight relief to it. So let's go ahead and plug it in and hear how it sounds. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
That was a little bit of taste attack for you with a song called Million Dreams and Sacred Field. You know, the best that I can play him anyways. <laughs> I'd like to describe the tone as kind of like open and airy. This thing is so light in comparison to my Tak Matsumoto Les Paul. That's nice because that thing was pretty heavy. Let's grab some clean tones now. <laughs> Now that we know all about this obscure Gibson shape, what are my final thoughts on this? I always wanted to document one just to say, yep, I documented it. We can move on, it's just another double cut. It's not my favorite, but some people like these, but no. I actually liked it better than the Tack Burst, but then again, this is Custom Shop. That one's Gibson USA, so a little bit different of build quality there. Not that one's bad and the other one's better, it's just they're different. I really like this because of the lightweight. It's still solid. And it, it still feels like you're playing a Les Paul. It's a very strange phenomenon. I don't necessarily like the switch because when you're playing it, it does seem to stick up a little bit more than normal. But at the same time, having it there, it just you know makes everything feel right. So if you've always been curious about one of these or maybe you didn't like it in the past, I would suggest trying one. I think they might be hidden gems for the USA market anyway. I'd really like to see Gibson come out with something similar to this for the USA market. And you don't even necessarily have to have tax name to it. And you could simplify some of the abalone and black inlays and just make it something new. Bring back the double cut standards in a different way. But only time will tell for that, my friends. If you're interested in being the next owner of this particular one, you can find it on my website, Trogley's Guitar guitarshow.com or if you have a different tack model you want to trade maybe we just keep this series going and finally document them all but all right troglonites i hope you enjoy your new guitar knowledge don't forget to like comment and subscribe and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one take care if you enjoyed tonight's episode consider subscribing i post videos like this every day and you might even enjoy this next one